Years ago, man I am old, but let's say mid-1990s I worked as a wildland firefighter while in the army reserves. I worked as a spotter, basically I was stationed in a giant fire tower in the middle of a national park. My job was just as it sounds, I would use binoculars and look out for fire, smoke, other telltale signs of fire. My nearest compadre was five miles or so from me. My days consisted of working my shift, taking long walks around the fire tower, being on the lookout for anyone who might be having illegal fires, looking out for wildlife, and staying with a lot of bears and wolves. The way our shifts worked back then was one week on, one week off. So we slept in the towers, cooked our food, etc. There were nearby toilets and showers, for our. One day I came across an illegal bear trap, I had several ranger friends and I safely set off the trap then picked it up to take to the ranger station on one of my treks for food in my jeep. Poaching is illegal in the park and carried a big fine even back then and some jail time but it did not stop the poachers from trying. I heard rifle shots and headed back for my fire tower, we did have a rifle in the tower, to be used in cases of emergencies. Just a few months back a fellow spotter had been mauled to death by a grizzly so each tower had been outfitted with a rifle. I looked with my binoculars but did not see anything out of the ordinary. I radioed my co-worker Ben, an older guy in the adjacent tower. He hadn't heard anything today but had come across a few traps himself. That night after a dinner of frank and beans and toast, I was writing to my future wife when I heard the rumbling of a truck. Thinking it may be Ben, occasionally he made the trek over, we would crack open a soda and chew the fat for a bit. Instead I saw four men with rifles get out of the truck, one looked around and leaned up against the truck while the other three grabbed traps and began to set them up. I grabbed the rifle and my lantern and headed down the stairs. I was only 21, a farmer's son from a rural Virginia farming town and even with one deployment behind me I was naive. I should have called it into the rangers but instead I thought I could talk some sense into four dangerous men. I barely got a, hey what are you doing, out of my mouth before I was roughly shoved by rough hands. My lantern fell, and I heard it crack. The rifle was kicked away from me and I felt the breath leave my chest when I was violently kicked in the stomach. I barely had caught my breath when I was grabbed by two of the men, and was shoved forward into the woods. It seemed like we walked for miles but in reality it was probably only a mile. However I noticed that there were no sounds, in the forest it is rarely silent. It's a cacophony of sounds, even at night. Owls, wolves, crickets, but on this night, nothing. Suddenly I was shoved onto my knees and I felt hot tears well up. I thought of my parents, my little sister and brother and my fiancé who were back home in Virginia. I heard the rack of a gun and I shut my eyes and prayed, suddenly the night erupted. However it was the sounds of sirens, those of the forest rangers, and behind them in his pickup, Ben who had tried to radio me that he had heard a car's engine came to my tower when I didn't reply. The poachers were arrested, Ben drove me back to the tower, I was still shaking. He didn't lie to me for not following procedure, just said, that was a close kid. I ended up leaving the job months later, to take a job closer to home but I never ran into any more poachers during the rest of my time. I kept in contact with Ben for a while, sent him a wedding invite and then a photo of my firstborn son in 1997. However as time usually does, we lost track of one another, and a few years back I googled him, he would have been 75 or so to discover he passed away a few years back. Don't know what ever came of those poachers but I know I never want to meet them again. My mom's dog, Punky, was a very sweet, loving dog. She was an ESA dog, but trained to be a service dog for PTSD before she lost her leg. I had never seen her get aggressive with anyone in the entire 12 years she lived, she never growled or nipped anyone, and she had no sense of smell so she loved all animals and people, a real gentle giant among our little terriers at 60 pounds, what I'm getting at here was that her barking at something and being aggressive was so wildly uncharacteristic that I only saw it once. I, who was an 11-year-old female, was at home with my siblings, who were younger, 
My then stepdad was at work and my mom ran up to the gas station to grab a pack of cigarettes, it was only a mile or two away from us. For reference, we lived in a two-bedroom trailer in the middle of the woods, on a dead-end road at the time, and you had to really make an effort to get down our road, find our house, navigate down our rickety driveway, and find the door. I'm sitting at the computer, having a grand time watching YouTube videos, when all of a sudden all of our dogs, about two Boston Terriers and one Chihuahua, perk up, bark a few times, and start investigating down the hall. My siblings were napping in the bedroom at the end of the hall at the time, so I figure they just stirred and scared the dogs. But then Punky sits up suddenly, stands up on the couch, and puffs her chest out. Her ears are perked up, her fur standing on end, her tail straight up, and then she barks. Loudly. I mean, the bark booms through the living room and echoes around, and all of a sudden she lunges off of the couch and goes tearing down the hallway. I'm already on edge because I don't think I've heard her bark. Ever. She's a Basenji mix, so her bark is more of a baying sound, but this was a big, loud, alert bark. I stand up and go to look down the hallway, ready to fight off what I'm assuming is a shadow monster in the hallway based on how the dogs are acting, but then I hear it. Knock knock knock. We didn't get visitors because of how weird our house was location-wise, so my 11-year-old mind had no clue what to do here. The only people who showed up were family, and they didn't knock, so I slowly walked towards the door. The knock drew the attention of the dogs, and they came running back down the hallway, all except for Punky, and I felt better with our three yappy dogs in the room with me, even if they were all the size of New York City sewer rats. I opened the door just a bit, and standing on our porch is the sketchiest man I think I've ever seen. I can still picture him perfectly. He was a really thin, taller man with dark hair and a sunken face, bags under his eyes, and this half-managed hair, sort of like he just gave it a quick brush and then figured it was good enough. Everything about him seemed just a little too thin, a little too shallow, and his clothes were all off too, they were nice, but, fake nice, you know. Like a clean, newer looking t-shirt and new jeans, but he had what looked like a suit jacket on. All his clothes were dark too, despite the fact that it was summer in Texas and the weather was definitely into the 100s that day. He also had this plain, unlabeled bottle in his hand, it looked like the label had been covered up and taped over. I stare up at him in confusion because I definitely don't know this man, and I ask what he wants. He smiles at me in this way that's way too fake, like this exaggerated and forced grin, and he spoke in the same voice retail workers do, hey there, kiddo. I'm trying to sell this carpet cleaner here, and he shakes the bottle at me, mind if I come in to show you how good it works. Alarms are going off in my head because he just seemed so, off. Looking back with an adult perspective, the fact that he didn't ask if my parents were home is unnerving, because he probably knew they weren't and that's why he was here in the first place. I should have told him to get off our property, that I'd have to go get my mom, something except what I did say, but I didn't. Instead I just shook my head and said, no, we don't have carpet. Well, it works on other things. And he took a big step towards the door and shook the bottle at me. I start to freak out and think to close the door, but the thing is, our front door didn't even lock, small town, hard to access home, we never needed a lock, so that's basically useless. I'm sure there's something very wrong about to happen and I'm terrified as I think about what to do in the few seconds I think I have before it does happen, when all of a sudden I hear it. Punky had crept up from the hallway, lowered towards the ground with her teeth barred and snarling like she was feral. She had slobber just dripping from her mouth, her ears were down and she was ready to pounce. The guy hears it too, and as I look towards Punky she tries to lunge past me and I just barely catch her with my leg as she tries her hardest to duck past me and attack this guy. He freaks out and runs off the porch without another word, booking it down the driveway as I let Punky out along with the rest of our dogs and they start chasing him. Our small dogs chase him down the driveway and stop about halfway, barking and jumping about, but Punky stops just on the porch and watches him with her ears perked, just staring in the distance until he disappears. I swear I saw someone join up with him running when he got onto the road. 
The second he disappeared, Punky's entire body language changed and she went back to being the sweet dog I knew, no barking or growling, just laying around, mouth and throat covered in slobber still. I realized my siblings are still down the call and ran to check on them. And when I got to the bedroom, my siblings were sleeping soundly still. But the bedroom window was wide open, the curtains pushed all to one side and the items on the dresser in front of the window all shoved around. Someone had tried to climb through the window, no doubt in my mind about it. From what I can gather, the bedroom window was visible from the couch, where Punky was sleeping, so I think someone was trying to climb through the window before Punky went after them and scared them off, and the man at the door was meant to distract me. They definitely didn't expect Punky, a bigger dog, because most of the time she was with my mom inside while our small dogs were the ones that saw the public eye more often. I don't know what they intended to do, but after my mom got home she took all of us to my aunt's house, and on our way there we saw the men walking up someone else's driveway. Men plural, because we watched a second one split off to wait by the road. So, to the two men apparently going door to door to sell their unlabeled carpet cleaner, I'd really rather not meet again. I grew up in Ohio in the 70s and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time we could manage it. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest and my parents would drop me off in the morning and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We'd only come out for school. We loved pretending we were frontiersmen, we'd build shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks, the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion to pull up Stand By Me. This was based on the movie of the same name that had just come out. The idea was that we'd walk the railroad tracks out in the country. But instead of looking for a dead body, we'd find cool bridges to fish from, and camp a little ways off the tracks. Of course we knew this was dangerous and we'd likely be trespassing, but we were kids. We had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers, we discovered bridges no one went to, we fished, we hid from trains. At night we camped in woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was idyllic. In fact, it was so fun we did it multiple times. Never had a problem. After high school me and Joe went our own ways. We both left home, but always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so we'd see each other occasionally. Well one summer in the mid-90s it worked out that we were both in town for about a week. We'd do stuff with family during the day, and at night we'd either catch drinks at a bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. One night, me and Joe got to talking about our stand-by-me trips. Well, nostalgia and beer are a hell of a mix. Soon we decided to take a day, walk the rails, camp one night and walk home. The day came, we started out early in the morning. We had my wife drop us off in our old spot where we used to start, right outside our hometown. She thought this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away, Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we take the opposite direction, just to be adventurous. We knew the land well, we had a map, so I gave a, what the hell, and off we set. The day went fine. It was fun, and a little sad, but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the edge, smoked a joint and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and other stuff. Before night started to set in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forested area, trees on every side of the train tracks so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We had brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now, this is what we used to do in the old days too. We'd walk the area around a little bit to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over a hill and we were actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe a hundred or so feet into the woods and up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from on top of this short hill, we'd be fine. But when we got to the top, we saw an old building down at the bottom, about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. 
We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something, because there didn't appear to be a clear road into it. From where we were, there didn't look to be anyone in it either. All was quiet, no movement could be seen. No lights. We decided to walk a little closer just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly and as we neared the building we saw it wasn't a sugar shack at all, it was an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a squat, sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. A cross still stood on top of the place, also weathered black. None of the windows had glass and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside, there were rows of pews and a built-up section in front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in, we didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints, no paths, no roads. It was an abandoned church. We left immediately and went back up the hill to our spot we had picked to camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better, but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up to the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit. Besides, at this point it was dusk and we just decided to rig up our hammocks and go to sleep and move on early in the morning. Night set in, and as we lay in our hammocks and shot the shit, we began to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Do you hear that? What the fuck is that? It sounds like, people singing. And it did sound just like singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two, and the singing continued but it wasn't getting louder. Finally we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days, it was second nature to us. The moon was barely out but it provided enough light so you wouldn't walk right into a tree, but it was near pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill and we didn't talk. When we got to the top we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church. And the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to, can you believe this shit? The light looked to be candlelight from the way it flickered, and though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in another language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there, but we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either, we had about a football field length between us and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit, and then it stopped. After that, a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared the shit out of me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you see in movies, but again it was like he was speaking in a different language because we couldn't understand a single word. Eventually it got to where the single male voice would say something and then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while and then they all broke into this long, sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so, disturbing that I covered my ears. Then it stopped. At this point I was just getting ready to say, let's get the fuck out of here, when Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed, they're coming out. We were far enough away that we couldn't make out really well, but what we could see was a line of figures walking out the open doorway, all holding hands in single file. We could see some of them had flashlights. They began to sing again, and the light from the flashlights began to move toward us and the hill. We booked it back down to our campsite, grabbed our shit and ran to the tracks. Once there, we ran down the tracks in the direction we had come from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back. We saw lights coming down the hill. They were moving erratically like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a road. By our map we knew a small town was about 15 minutes down it, and we walked there, got to a 24-hour gas station and called my wife to come get us. My wife and other friends all just thought it was kids messing around, but I heard those voices and they sure as hell didn't sound like kids to me. 
Not sure who those people were, but it was definitely the creepiest thing that happened to me out in the woods.